We've got loads of stuff coming up for you on this week's Ask GC Anything, from route planning to riding etiquette to coffee to Sai's favourite subject, which is helmet cleaning. Yeah, that is true. But first of all, let us turn to a question from Twitter, from Eden, who has asked if we can talk about what happens when you change your crank length. I think you should start us off then. Yeah, size is important to you. Uh, yeah, well, I've always been of the opinion that length doesn't make too much difference. But this is a very hot topic at the moment because reportedly Vincenzo Nibali changed to 175mm cranks at the start of this year from 172.5. Now, goodness knows why. He was very successful before he made that change. But we also understand that he reverted back to 172.5s for the final week of the Giro. And we all know what happened there. Exactly. Proving irrefutably that riding shorter cranks will help you win the Giro d'Italia. Or maybe not. Because actually, there isn't really any difference to performance. I've got 175s on some of my bikes, 172.5s on others, and actually there is no difference at all between the two. But then that isn't really why you would change cranks. It's really if you are particularly short or particularly tall, in which case then you change them for comfort reasons. Or for aerodynamics, actually, because mm. Bradley Wiggins uses 170s, and that's to help him get lower. Yeah, quite a few of the track riders are going to shorter cranks, aren't mm. they? Anyway, this might be a good idea to watch the next video, because Sai and Matt actually went into a laboratory and did a GCN scientific experiment looking into crank length. You can find it here. Yeah, there's me doing slow-mo. <laughs> With Simon warming up behind me, I'm going to take this opportunity to explain how we're going to test him. Now there are two parameters, the first of which is his peak power, so the ability to sprint and to accelerate, and also his ability to sustain high power for a long period of time. You ready, Si? Yeah. Next up, Ruby Gaming Studios asked this under last week's Ask GCN. What is the best way to plan your route? Oh, that's an interesting one it because is. there are a whole host of websites which will help you with this online. So everything from uh, Map My Rides to Strava to Ride With GPS to Garmin Connect to Bike Route Toaster to Endomondo, a whole host of them and you'll be able to find plenty more as well. But we've always found that the best ones are those that use other riders' data from previous rides. That way when you, when you plan from A to B or around route and a certain distance, it will use that data to make sure you're on the most bike friendly routes, the ones that the locals use and you're probably going to get a cracking ride. That is true, but it's not just about clicking on your computer screen until you get the right distance. I'm a big fan of going old school as well. There are loads of other ways to find the best routes, as this video actually tells you. Now, you can do all the personal research you want, but nothing quite beats local knowledge. So how do you best tap into that resource? Well, one of the best places to start is at your local quality bike shop. The chances are there'll be some people working there who ride themselves, so they'll be able to point you to the best local rides. Also, it might well be they organise some rides themselves each week. So if you're lucky, they'll even invite you out on one of those. Now, in a similar vein to your local shop, your local club is also a great way of finding the best roads. So just get onto Google and search for either a club that's local to you now or, in fact, where you want to go, and then just hook up with them. It's time now for the quick fire round. As the name suggests, we should crack straight on with it. So first up, John Zhu. Are pro cyclists comfortable in their aggressive riding positions, or is it normal to sacrifice some lower back discomfort for, aer for aerodynamics? Yeah, I'd say largely they are. Because, and, but actually they don't really sacrifice any comfort either. Because if you think about it, if you're doing a grand tour and you've got a sore back on the first day, that's going to get pretty uncomfortable after 20 days. Yeah. When I retired actually, I popped my stem up a little bit and came back a bit. I, I, just because I guess... I and you're more comfortable? Much. I'm the same level of comfort, just slightly less aero. Uh, what you have to remember with pro cyclists is that they have all been doing it generally since probably 12, 13, 14 years of age at the latest. So they've been in that position for a long, long time. They've had years to get used to it. So they're probably more comfortable in that position than they would be with a much higher stem at the front. Uh, Rickster asks, hashtag talkback, when riders get specially coloured bikes like Nibali's pink bling thing or even Stephen Kreisweit's green pink Bianchi, is that a vinyl wrap or do they really come up with a custom and painted bike overnight? Well, I think the answer is probably different manufacturers do different things, don't they? You get some people that end up in the leader's jersey and the manufacturer is probably quite surprised by that fact and therefore their customised bike isn't very customised, whereas Specialised clearly were banking on Nibali taking the pink That's jersey true. and so they 
presented that incredible looking custom paint job that probably took hours and hours and hours. Yeah, and some things are much easier to make custom than others. So a frame set like the one that Specialized produced would have taken a lot of thought and effort beforehand, whereas some of the components, maybe like saddles, bar tape in particular, don't take much thought or effort at all. No, they don't. All right, next up, uh, Michael, Sh <laughs> you've given me the difficult name, Schluber. Schluber? Anyway, Michael has asked, uh, riding solo, you cross paths with an experienced rider. You chat as you ride for a few miles, you already know he's turning shortly. He punctures. You check you have everything you need. Should you carry on and st or stop and watch him change a tube? Oh, God, I'd carry on. You'd carry on? I'd carry on. I'd carry on. Yeah. If you're out for a ride with somebody from start to finish, of course you wait around. You don't just leave them there to deal with it on their own and both go solo to the end. But if you've just bumped into somebody, I don't want to stop there. It's got to be said though, we're British and British people are inherently uncomfortable in any social situation. So maybe if you were American, you'd yeah. probably stand and have a nice chat and enjoy yourself. But you know, we'd just be a bit buttoned up, yeah. wouldn't we? We'd be thinking, thank goodness it's awkward this is about to finish. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to carry on my way by myself. Simon Taylor says, hey geez, and quick, quick, quick question. You see the pros in the peloton throwing their empty bottles into the countryside. Do they use special compostable or biodegradable bottles or does some poor chap have to tidy all their stuff up? Thanks. Well, when you say riders throwing bottles, uh, people will actually, spectators, will go to a race specifically to pick up water bottles, won't they? So water bottles will not go to waste. And most riders are pretty good about putting energy gel wrappers and stuff back in their pockets now, I think, aren't they? Yeah, that's changed over the last few years, hasn't it? Because it is horrible to see uh, the aftermath of a sportive oh. race with gel wrappers all over the place. Uh, in answer to your first part of your question, I have had biodegradable bottles from Team Sport, but goodness knows how long it takes for them to biodegrade once they're left out in the open. And they do now, in the major races, have green zones, which is like a 500 metre or one kilometre length of road where riders are able to throw everything out of their pocket and somebody will come along later and just pick up everything and all the rubbish from that specific point. Dan's got a green zone just to the left of the desk there and he throws his tea mug down there when he's finished. Yeah, you, mate? that's true. Ready for you to collect it afterwards. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, Tice Vintiers says, hashtag talkback, why this exact hashtag for Ask GCN anything? We have no idea, but this does remind us to tell you that that is the hashtag if you want to write in and get your questions answered next week. Okay, this next question comes from Zippy7, who also underneath last week's show asked this. He wants to know, what is the best way to clean his helmet? Now, as I said at the start of this show, this is size specialist subject, so over to you, Si. Seriously, mate, I'm getting a little bit upset that you think I spend my life cleaning helmets. Now, okay, you've already said that you used shampoo and water. That's a pretty good place to start, but I can get better than that. Check out this video behind, where I actually take you through the process, step by step, in great detail. Yep. As a quick wash, just dunk the lid in a bucket of cool water and wash it with a sponge. Now, it's a great way of getting all the surface muck off the lid, getting you looking shiny again for your next ride. If you want to clean it more thoroughly, then just be careful about using any harsh cleaning products on it. So, nothing more, in fact, than a mild pH neutral soap like a dish soap. Certainly, petroleum or solvent based cleaners are an absolute no no, as both can seriously compromise and damage the integrity of the helmet. Last question for this week, I'm afraid, and it comes from Camping556, who was asked, is there a connection between coffee and cycling? Uh, good question. I actually can't think of a specific direct connection between the two, but there's no denying that the vast majority of cyclists do seem to appreciate a nice coffee. I guess that might be down to the coffee stop culture, nice socialising moment with friends out on a ride. It might be down to the fact that there is a proven ergogenic performance benefit of caffeine. Or it might just be that it tastes really nice. It does taste so good. Now, whilst I was out at the Giro, uh, I caught up with the guys at Rocket Espresso and they showed us how to make the perfect espresso. So I suggest if you do like coffee, then you check it out. To make the perfect espresso, what we need to do is we need good beans, we need a burr grinder, and we need a decent machine. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get from a double porter filter, 50 to 60 mils of espresso in 30 seconds. And that's basically the key to good espresso. Well, that brings this week's episode of Ask GC Anything to a close. But don't forget, if you've got a burning cycling question, then we'll do our best to answer it on next week's show. So just leave them in the comment section just down below or on Twitter or Facebook using hashtag TalkBack. 
Now, if you are wanting yet more GCN content, and I'm sure you might be, then if you click just up there, then we've got a cracking little video called the five genius bike accessories. Really want to check that out. And we've talked a bit about our Giro d'Italia content in this video, but if you've missed any of it, we've put it all into one handy playlist, which you can find in that corner down there. Yeah, and make sure you subscribe to GCN before you leave us. To do that, you just click on the globe.